So today, Edison Kim from Transport Canada will introduce the Office of Boating Safety, projects that involve clean, drain, dry, and key points on preventing the spread of invasive species. We also have a second presenter today joining us. Uh, Nick Wong is the Research and Projects Coordinator with the Invasive Species Council of BC. And he will basically talk about the Invasive Species Council and highlight the importance of practicing clean, drain, dry, and the impact aquatic invasives can have on our habitats and our communities. So I hope you all had a chance to sign in early and get any technical glitches worked out. Uh, if for some reason you're experiencing any technical difficulties, just write a note in the chat box and our ISCBC technical support will send you a private message to help you out. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, just feel free to pop them into the chat window. The host will answer any non-speaker related questions. And then at the, end of both, uh, at the end of both presentations, we'll have time to answer your questions. And if we run out of time, then we can send out the answers to your questions by email. So to start, we'd like to find out who is here and where you all work, where you're from, and also what your areas of interest are. So if you haven't already, could you please pop that into the chat box and then we can review them while I'm introducing Edison and Nick. So Edison Kim is a resident of Vancouver. He joined the Office of Boating Safety at Transport Canada in March 2020 when he transitioned over from the Royal Canadian Navy where, it, where he had been serving as a naval warfare officer. He, currently, he also currently acts as an advisor for the Tourism Invasive Wise Program for the Invasive Species Council of BC. Nick Wong, the Research and Projects Coordinator with the ISCBC, has diverse experience working previously in Pacific salmon and herring fisheries in BC and has a PhD in marine ecology from the University of Auckland, New Zealand. Nick is passionate about teaching and creating engaging opportunities for people to learn and understand the role they can play in the prevention and mitigation of invasive species. So at this point, I'm gonna pass the mic over to our first presenter and that's Edison and I hope you all enjoy the webinar. Hi, thank you. Uh, hi everyone, I'm just gonna be setting up, sharing my screen. All right, hi everyone, uh, thank you for the intro. Uh, like you said, I'm an OBS officer with Transport Canada, and I'm just gonna be giving an outline of what we do at the Office of Boating Safety and kind of how we work with our regional partners with combating the invasive species problem. So what the Office of Boating Safety does is our goal is to promote safe boating throughout BC, at least for our Pacific region. Um, the biggest thing we do is we provide awareness of, for regulatory requirements for boating in Canada. This has been incredibly important, especially over the events of the past few months. Um, there's a lot of confusion of what's allowed, what isn't. So we've been kind of that first line response um, for people who have any inquiries. Um, we also collaborate with industry stakeholders and partners. So there's with that, we get a lot of inside info and as well as we provide the networking opportunities for these other partners. Um, Space Peace Council was involved uh, yesterday with the meeting we had with the Recreational Boating Advisory Council. Um, in addition, our big thing is outreach, which is kind of important for what we want to accomplish for combating invasive species. So as well as our own mission, which is safe boating. So we participate in these safe boating campaigns. We communicate safe boating messages as well as, especially with the COVID situation, we've been promoting a lot of proper messaging in terms of how to act in the water, um, the proper social distancing part, as well as providing advice for businesses to operate. Um, yeah, and then kind of as I say, we're like kind of that first line response for public inquiries. Um, so yeah, even for any callers, emails, we answer questions for how, for their licensing, as well as what they need for competency to operate on the water. And then another big thing that we do is we assist with local governments, uh, small communities and the First Nations in initiating BORS, the Vessel Operation 
restriction regulations. So say that there's a body of water where a community wants to have no power driven vessels, they just want human powered vessels only. We work with them to get those type of measures passed. Um, and the big project we've been working on lately is conducting Canada Shipping Act training with our enforcement partners, such as the RCMP, Department of Fisheries and Oceans, um, just even local municipal police departments. Just due to what's ha been happening lately, we've had to move a lot of that training online, but we've still been successful and have trained over 100 officers in the Canada Shipping Act 2001 over the past two months. So uh, this is kind of an outline of some of the partners we work with here just in BC alone. Uh, as you can see, Vancouver Police Department, RCMP, Spaces Species Council, and then yes, we also have quite a bit of national partners as well. So kind of going into what the type of work we do specifically with our invasive species partners is, well, we're aware that boats are a major vector for aquatic invasive species. So as, I, as has been stated that I'm an advisor with uh, Invasive Species Council for one of their campaigns. Um, I have a, several other fellow officers who do the same for different organizations. And like our big thing is outreach because we have access to um, so many large community events such as boat shows, um, just any festivals that go on. We're really out there in the public to provide like this material and share the message. And our big plan that we had planned for this year was that we were gonna have a joint effort of co-locating Office of Boating Safety Officers with AIS inspection stations to share both message, messages of safe boating and in addition to combating invasive species. But obviously this situation is complicated what these plans were for this year. Um, we're still hoping that things will change by the summer, but if not, then for next year, we're hoping to have this new outreach plan of co-locating OBS officers with the AIS stations um, sent out. Uh, that's basically it uh, on my end, but if there's any questions, I'm here to more than free to answer anything. If anyone has any questions for Edison, you can type it into the chat box. And then I can relay those questions to Edison for you. So Edison Sue has a question. She's voting right now on the coast. Yeah, uh, so that's a good question. That's actually one that we've been getting quite a bit of. There are some restrictions uh, in terms of commercial operations, but recreational boating right now is allowed as well as boating for substance, um, especially for those small communities who rely on that type of boating. Um, transportation is also allowed, but um, there are a few restrictions in place which I can send out. Perfect, thank you for your answer, Edison. Um, Daryl has a question. I'm wondering if there has been any issues with uh, zebra mussels yet in BC? Uh, well, at least on our end, we haven't really received any notice in regards to that, um, that our focus is more on the actual boating safety versus aquatic invasive species. Um, and sorry, it just looks like Sue sent a follow-up question of pleasure boating is okay. Yes, right now pleasure boating is okay, but we do ask that we follow the provincial and federal guidelines in regards to that. And some municipalities have certain other guidelines in place that you will be required to follow.
Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Edison, for your presentation. That was uh, some great information that you shared. And now I'd like to invite Nick Wong to start his presentation. Hello, everyone can hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Nick. Okay, nice. Okay, so. Uh, sorry, can you see me now too? Sorry to see my uh, screen. All right. Well, yeah. Yes, just, so you can uh, see your screen. Great. So just here to, to uh, hello, I'm Nick. Um, uh, yeah, research and, and projects coordinator with the Invasive Species Council and just uh, touch on the clean drain drive and the program a little bit. So basically, uh, the goal of, of clean drain dry is to prevent the spread of aquatic invasive plants, animals and microorganisms to BC waters. So we've, the ISCBC has had a dedicated clean drain drive program for a while now. Um, it, it began back in 2012 with a provincial pilot, uh, along with 12 regional invasive species committees, uh, what we like to call RISOs, uh, and sharing messaging with boaters at, at boat launches across BC. Over the coming years, it, it, it evolved to include partner, partnerships, actual partnerships with these RISOs, uh, sharing messages with boaters at some of the more high risk locations and at other education sort of outreach events. Um, and then again, in 2014, we, we added the, the Clean Drain Dry Ambassador Program, where we provided for training for some of, some of the people like you, maybe listening on the call today to actually become an, an ambassador to help deliver the, the Clean Dry message in your area. And then again, in 2018, uh, things for ourselves changed a little bit more. And we, we uh, working together, uh, under contract with CSIS and with funding from the Department of Fisheries and Oceans started a, a three year pilot term project where um, looking to shift the behavior of boaters and aquatic recreationists, recreationists by encouraging clean drain dry. Um, and so we've we've partnered with stewards of BC's lakes and rivers. Uh, this includes ports and marinas, local stewardship groups, again, those Rizzo's municipalities, resorts, campgrounds, um, and indigenous communities. Um, and the way we, we propose to do this is, is changing people's behavior using a variety of tools, such as prompts and incentives, commitments and social norms and, and vivid communication. So we produce some pretty eye-catching resources, uh, some signage and have, a, have, have a, a dedicated social and digital media campaign. Uh, keep keep an eye out on on TV for some PSAs and social media uh, upcoming. Uh, anyway, so the first the first phase of this program was to sort of test out the signage and uh, at, at various places. And this map here just is just in a little uh, screenshot of kind of where some of the the resources have ended up in the signage over the last couple of years. And so we've we've partnered with over sixty five groups so far, um, and we're moving into that final year. So yes, so no, know a little bit about the program, but what exactly is clean, clean, drain, dry? Why should we be cleaning, draining and drying? And uh, what could happen if, if we don't do it effectively? So why should we be clean, drain, drying? Well, as humans, we're, we're sort of part of the issue, basically transporting uh, invasive pests to new areas they could attach, physically attach to a, a surface or become caught within the internal compartments of your boat or maybe uh, as weeds stuck on your trailer or the propeller of your boat. And then once these invasives spread to new areas, they can quickly take over. And uh, given the right conditions, um, you could, for instance, see uh, on the top left, we've got yellow flag iris. This, this just takes over the shorelines. And then, for instance, on the bottom right, we've got um, uh, parrot's feather completely overtaking uh, this pond. 
for myself, and I think like many of you uh, listening today, uh, you have a keen interest uh, in in protecting BC's biodiversity and and BC is Canada's most biodiverse province, so it's it's definitely definitely worth conserving. So why why should we be clean drain drying? Oh, sorry, no. So uh, as often as the case, many aquatic invasive species have uh, parts or even life stages that are easily transportable. Uh, and they can often be really tough to see or even notice. So uh, juvenile zebra and quagga mussels are, are really tiny. They can often even just look like debris. So in the, in the right picture here, we've got some, some juvenile zebra mussels. Um, and even if uh, they're smaller than that, say you run your hand along the surface of the boat, it could almost feel like sandpaper. Thus, if we can't see it, we should probably enlist some help uh, from someone or something that could. So BC actually has canine, uh, canine Kilo and Canine Major, who are actually uh, capable of sniffing out live and dead zebra mussels, which is pretty, pretty incredible stuff. Also, for, for many aquatic plant species, they could have floating seeds or uh, could regrow even just from small, minute fragments of root or rhizome or even a piece of stem. So even small pieces can, can uh, result in, in maybe a new infestation. So what are you going to do the next time you hit the water? Or hopefully you're doing this, doing this already. So you're going to be cleaning all surfaces. So you'll inspect, uh, inspect and clean all plants, animals, mud, uh, and mud from the watercraft trailer or gear. Um, and remember, this is for all boat types. This is just uh, this is not just for motorized. This is this includes your 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 kayaks, your canoes, your standal paddle boards, that type of thing. You're also going to drain all of the water from your watercraft. Uh, trailer and gear. So that could include buckets. You could can include live wells, uh, bilges or ballast or ballast tanks. And don't forget to pull the plugs. Depending on the species and sort of the life stages of, of different things, they can persist in, in standing water for days. For instance, a, a zebra mussel can, can live um, as long as it's in the shade out of water for up to 20 days. So um, Make sure you're you're cleaning and drying uh, all surfaces. And lastly, dry all parts of your watercraft uh, trailer and gear completely between trips before before moving on. So, what could happen if we don't uh, clean, drain, dry efficiently? Well, we really only have to look uh, to our provincial neighbors to see uh, what could happen if we don't do our part. In 2014, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, or, or CFIA, uh, estimated the annual impact of aquatic invasive species to the Great Lakes alone at uh, over $7 billion for aquatics. Um, and six years on, this, this, uh, this value is quite uh, likely larger than that. Um, Aquatic, aquatic invasive species spell bad news for, for native ones and, and native biodiversity through the competition for key, key resources like food and space. Uh, filter feeders like zebra and quagga mussels uh, can siphon up uh, and filter vast quantities of water and therefore um, removing all the planktonic food for other things. Um, and that can also lead to what is called uh, oligro... Uh, oligotrophication. And if a water body is called oligotrophic, it means it has very low levels of nutrients, which isn't, which is uh, basically not good for, good for anything else. Um, aquatic plants like Eurasian milfoil, um, in the bottom right, we've got a rototiller in, uh, in the Okanagan, um, rototilling this, this uh, nasty invasive, invasive weed. And these can create really dense monocultures uh, um, and basically take up the space um, and reduce recreational opportunities. Uh, and say, if you have a, you have a house on, on said lake, it could potentially reduce your property values. Um, 
zebra and quagga mussels can, when they die, leave really sharp uh, shells uh, uh, littering the beach. So that's a bit of a, a human health and safety cost. Um, and, you know, we haven't even talked about the, the economics of it yet. Say, for example, if uh, uh, zebra and quagga mussels, for instance, were to establish in all the areas in BC, uh, it was estimated cost to hydropower, uh, agricultural irrigation, uh, municipal water supplies and recreational boating would, would be estimated around 43 million. Um, and that doesn't account any account for any impacts to fisheries or thinking about tourism related to th those types of things. So there, there are knock-ons on top of these things. Um, and for instance, rototilling uh, and managing all the, the Eurasian milfoil in the Okanagan Valley costs upwards of 800,000 K a year. So there are some significant uh, economic impacts if, if we don't clean, drain, dry efficiently. So speaking back to uh, Daryl's uh, question earlier, there's still, a, speaking to uh, zebra and quagga mussels at least, um, they're about as far west as Lake Winnipeg. So luckily there are a couple, a couple borders in between us and BC is talking with Alberta and Saskatchewan and, and vice versa. So, um, yeah. But sometimes it's, it's more than just clean drain dry. Say it could require decontamination, say if coming from another province. So if you're transporting or moving your boat uh, and you happen to pass an inspection station, make sure you, you stop and, and get inspected. Uh, it, it is illegal to stop and you could get fined. So it's uh, really not worth it. And in 2018, the Provincial Muscle Defense Program, uh, um, which sort of guides a lot of these watercraft inspection stations, uh, inspected 40,700 40, boats and actually uh, intercepted 25 boats which had uh, mussels attached to them. So. Uh, we need to stay vigilant and uh, and keep keep cleaning, draining, and drying. So, if you are interested in maybe becoming a partner or know someone who does and have a have a, a nice fresh water body that you'd like to to visit, uh, please visit our the CD Pilot website uh, and uh, look into that. Um, that's all for me. Uh, thanks thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Nick, for that excellent presentation. So I just want to invite um, any of the participants, if you have a question for Nick, just pop it into the chat box. Uh, Nick, I already have a few questions from the audience. So Stephanie is wondering, should you be using hot water or cold water when cleaning any uh, watercraft? Um, I think it's, it kind of depends on the species. Uh, a lot of these a lot of these things, um, I think the, the mere pressure of, of the, the water would be enough just to, to get it off. Um, but there are, are, are definitely some best practices that you probably want to follow. I, I can't speak to species off the top of my head or anything, but um, uh, it kind of it depends, I think, on, on, uh, on what, what you're using. Yeah. Perfect, thank you. And then Rena has a question. I'm just wondering what happens to the mussels that are that are power washed off of boats. Um, she's wondering, do they just go into like a nearby like water catchment system or onto the lawn? Um, you know, off, off the top of my head, I I don't think I can answer that question. At the, I'm assuming you mean at the inspection stations. Yes, um, a good rule of thumb with with any and when you're anti-fouling your boat or or any of these types of things is just to do it all on land and nowhere near a drain or any of that type of thing you, you never know what could uh, sort of find its way in there so always if you can do any of your management activities well away from the water uh, would be would be the most the most effective way to go yeah yeah, I've got a tandem kayak and whenever I clean it out, it's always over my lawn. So anything is nowhere near a water source. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Uh, Sue has a question. Uh, she's just wondering if but you can remind all of us how long muscle villagers, hopefully I said that right, can live in standing water. Yeah, I think, I think Leo's, Leo's right. Uh, it's kind of depending on temperature, as long as they don't desiccate, it could, it could be anywhere from, from, yeah, I think up to about 20 days. And they're, Perfect. they're minuscule microns big, so. So make sure you dry up all that standing, standing water. And then the next question is from Blake. Uh, Blake is wondering, do most of the aquatic invasive species originate from the oceans? Uh, not, necess not necessarily. There's, there's some things that are uh, brackish. So they're sort of in a, often in mixtures of in between saltwater and freshwater. It, it does really vary. I'll, in most cases, they more often sort of come from, they're getting sucked up in marinas and, and that type of thing, uh, and then being expelled in other places. So uh, there are definitely a lot in the ocean, but that I wouldn't say they're necessarily most. Yes, yeah, it's, not, it's not the rule per se. And then Stephanie just sent in a question. Um, just wondering, she says, UK guidance is hot water is preferable, but whatever people can manage is great. Um, if that is cold water, then still good. Not a question, but just a thank you, she says. So. Thanks, Stephanie. <laughs> Thanks, Stephanie, for that comment. Okay, I'll just give another minute for any last questions that anyone would like to ask. Ah, so there's another question there. Um, any precautions we can take to keep things from sticking to our boats? Yeah, there's definitely, there, there are some uh, anti-fouling paints that you can apply to boat hulls. Um, not, not necessarily things you wanna probably be painting your, your fiberglass kayak or, but yeah, there are some things I'd also recommend not Leave, if you can not leave your boat in the water, uh, it, that would be optimal as well. But um, yeah, those are probably the, the two main, the two main uh, precautions, I'd say, outside of clean, drain, dry. Yeah. And then Sue has a question there. I'm uh, wondering if green crabs can be spread by boats um, in bilge water. They are an issue here on the islands up the west coast, BC. Yeah, green crabs are, are the tricky ones. Um, the green crab is actually one of the world's uh, top 10 most invasive species, I guess, and it's pretty well found on every continent. And yeah, Sue is correct. They're, they're all up along the West Coast, and they've actually found a couple in Boundary Bay now. So they hadn't been finding their way into the Strait of Georgia, but it seems like uh, they're on their way. They are, yeah, again, microscopic as larvae, so they could be trapped, they could be transported uh, via bilge. It could be transported via, uh, yeah, any, again, any, any standing water in your, in your live wells. Yeah, that's, a, that's a, hopefully it, it sort of stays at bay and doesn't, doesn't uh, proliferate, but the strait is sort of optimal locations for the European green crab. And unfortunately, it's not really big enough to, to be, uh, to eat. I mean, you can eat it, but it's a lot of work. Thanks so much, Nick, for all your information. And I just want to say a big thank you from the Invasive Species Council of BC and um, from everyone that's listening. Just a thank you again to Edison and Nick for those two excellent presentations. So after this webinar, we'll be sending out a short link to an evaluation survey to all participants. So if you could please fill it out, it'd be great to have your feedback and any ideas for future webinars that we can offer. Uh, we also have another exciting webinar coming up next week to celebrate the last week of Invasive Species Action Month, and it's on the Don't Let It Loose program.
Uh, we also invite you to enter the What's in My Backyard photo contest. So taking part is really simple and you could actually win up to $350 for your family, youth group or class. The contest is running now and it closes on May 31st, 2020. So we're challenging you to spot and photograph as many invasive species in your yard or local area as you can. Um, to find out more information about our contest and uh, BC Invasive Species Action Month, you can check out um, the BC Invasive Species Action Month website. Uh, also, if you're wanting to look at fact sheets or find information on invasive species in BC, definitely check out the uh, BC, the Invasive Species Council of BC's website, which is bcinvasives.ca. And thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. And hopefully we'll see you again next week at the webinar. So enjoy the rest of your day.